All right. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Abigail Miorga. I'm the Ward 5 Community Liaison. Uh, we're going to get this meeting started. So, Mr. Chair, whenever you are ready. I guess call to order. Roll call. Perfect. Uh, Carol Crane. Here. Perfect. Uh, Gary Cecil. Here. Thank you. Bryce Chisholm. Absent at this time. And then Mr. Jeff Harvey. Here. Perfect. Uh, Council Member Taylor. Here. And then again, like I said, my name is Abigail Mayorga, accompanied with Jana Moyer on the tech. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Chair, you have a forum of the Ward 5 Neighborhood Advisory Board. Before we get started, uh, our first item will be public comment, but I do want to let everybody know uh, members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on reno.gov slash meetings. And bear with me. Uh, the virtual link is as follows, HTTPS US 06 WEB period Z O O M period US forward slash W E B I N A R forward slash R E G I S T E R forward slash capital W capital N underscore capital S six capital T capital C three capital S uh, capital I N capital T capital R I underscore N capital Q capital Z capital J capital H E S W O capital A. Have you having to come into that to memory yet? Uh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't hear all of that. <laughs> all right, perfect. Um, at this time, Mr. Chair, we do have one public commenter in the room, Mr. Ken Becker. Hello, I'm Ken Becker from 1306 Canyon Creek Road. Uh, Canyon Creek Park is a small city park on Rob Drive, just north of the freeway and south of Mayan Road, right across the street from the Big Grace Church. And I saw about a year ago in the city budget that they were going to be doing some upgrades. And so I called the city and talked to some guy in the park department. He said, oh, that just in the budget item, we haven't started the planning process. We'll let you know. And all the people, all the neighbors, our property, our home property is immediately adjacent to the park. And we hadn't heard anything yet. And yesterday morning, some heavy equipment came in and tore down all the children's playground equipment. Today, they finished up that. So I'd like to know how to find out what's going on, what they have planned. Do they still plan to keep the horseshoe pits, which are never used, and to find out what the plans are for that. And thank you. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Um, and then if anyone at this time would like to give public comment in the room, now would be the time. And then anyone on Zoom, if you would love to give, like to give public comment, please raise your hand. And then seeing none at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay. So we need to approve the agendas plural for January 9th, 2024 and September 12th, 2023 and October 10th, 2023. So A3, Mr. Chair, is just the approval of the agenda. So this agenda for today. Oh, okay. 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 Um, and prior to the approval, I do want to make note, unfortunately, our city clerk won't be able to make it today for item B2. So we're going to remove that and move it to February. She's currently at a different board, had a staff member call out. So okay. you're on ticket. Oh, okay. So we might have dropped a parking ticket. We have validated it. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Case is yours. Motion to approve the the agenda. Mr. Chair, make a motion to approve today's agenda. And a second. I second that motion. the agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Agenda is approved. How about the approval of the minutes? I've heard those very satisfied with them, so I'll make a motion to approve the agendas from September 12th and October 10th. And I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move on to A5, the council liaison report. Well, happy new year, everybody. Thank you for being here. Hope everybody had Good holidays. Uh, just a couple things. 
First of all, our Truckee River plan is out and we are asking for everybody's input on that. We're extending the date a little bit on it. So I'll leave these with you. They're uh, cards that you can scan the QR and go and take the survey. We really need everybody's input. Uh, we have about $3 million of ARPA funds that we're gonna be putting into the river. So um, exciting things coming that way. You all, I think, received a copy of our resource guide, which Abby, I'm super excited about. Thank you so much for all of your help with that. Um, we're maybe going to do something, a little bigger event with this in the future um, with actual agencies coming forward. We'll see how that looks. And we might be able to do it in our new cafe downstairs. Yeah. Um, we have coffee and some snacks, and we're very excited about that finally getting opened. Grace is going to talk a little bit about ADUs and that survey is open. So we're hoping that you guys can take the survey and spread the word on that. And a couple things uh, downtown, we started our facade improvement program, which we're super excited about. We worked with the Cal Neva um, for our first round junky clothing, and then a couple of businesses over in the brewery district. And I think we might be seeing some new banners downtown. I'll just keep you as a cliffhanger on that. Uh, I just learned today that we have more trash cans on 4th Street downtown. So that's good news. And that's what I have to report for this month. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Move to A6, staff liaison report. And I have actually no items, items to add. Take them off. Yeah, sorry. I know you're good. <laughs> okay, we can move on. Do we have the Reno Police Department for the quarterly update? So I did have an update on this. Uh, they let me know that they won't be able to attend today because our lieutenant, Lieutenant Die, who used to come to our NABS, is retired. He retired the during the time we were out. So that's really great news for him. So they're looking for his replacement at this time to take over the NAB schedule. But in the packet, there is the December and November stats. Um, so if you guys have any particular questions regarding those items, please feel free to let me know and I will connect you with a new appropriate person. Um, for those members in the audience who don't have the stats uh, with them, it will be uploaded to PrimeGov following the meeting within the next week to two weeks. Um, or I can give you my contact information and I can give those to you as well. Um, so yeah, that is that for RPD. Thank you. Moving on, B3, accessory dwelling units and short-term rental survey to garner public feedback. Okay. So if I should stand for the mic. Um, right here, good? I think for the camera, it would be best not to... Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Maybe by Mr. Chair. <laughs> I'm just going to do the whole lap. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm here today to try to solicit feedback for our accessory dwelling unit and short-term rental potential ordinances. Um, we got direction from council in November that they would like us to move forward with drafting an accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, and it seems to be a contentious topic. Ward five is interesting because you guys do have some planned unit developments in Somerset that already allow for accessory dwelling units. And so I think that it's good to get feedback from people who may have experience with these. Um, and downtown, I think it's important to look at short-term rentals and how that those can impact the community in an area. So we tried to make it a very quick, um, broad survey to say, this is our first step in the process. It will by no means be our final step with public input, but we wanna see what the community thinks and where they stand. Um, we noticed that for our code cleanup, we did nine to 12 public outreach meetings, and we had a hard time getting public input um, and participation. Gary was at one of those meetings, and we had three people at that meeting. Um, and so it was, it was tough. And so we thought for our next endeavor, how do we get more public outreach and more public input? And I think times have changed. It's, we've had this survey out for a week. And I was telling Councilmember Taylor, we already have 130 responses, so way different than what we've seen for public input, public feedback in the past. Um, and so our hope is that we will get the responses. We can have them on a map. Um, we wanna try to get a good representation throughout the city, not just one particular area. Um, and a di you know, diverse responses as well. And then we'll go back to council and we'll say, here's what the community thinks. 
here's the areas that actually want accessory dwelling units or they don't want them and what how should we move forward? Do you want us to go to these specific areas and try to see what the hurdles or barriers are for them? Um, and try, try to keep council in the loop as well. And then we will proceed with more public outreach and input um, and actually start drafting the ordinance. So this is the very first step in the process. I have some flyers. I don't mean to overburden you guys with surveys and stuff like that, but it is the new year. I have them available in Spanish as well. Um, so I'll leave a couple on the table. And if you know anyone that uh, wants to participate, um, I can send you a link that you can send out as well. Are there any questions? How long is that survey going to be up? Until the end of February. Okay. And that's a pretty good response rate for 130? Statistically, a good response rate is anywhere between 500 to 1,000 responses. Um, poll polling surveys will get that. And so if we can get above 500 responses, then it will be a statistically significant response rate. Um, and so we can rely, rely on those results as accurately representing the community. So it's no, a good be. response rate so far, but we have more to go. I know uh, the last meeting I attended here at the NAB, one of the uh, public comments was this very issue. So, mm -hmm. and they were very concerned about it. So um, hopefully we'll get a really good response mm -hmm. on that. Yep, and it it allows you to provide uh, open-ended answers. And so if you I have one, oh, good, okay, it. perfect. Well, any other questions? Yeah, is the argument going to be that you're looking at to get information when it's going to be a combined of this um, accessory dwelling unit and short-term rentals? I'm glad you asked that. That came up as a confusion. Why are we combining these two mm -hmm. things? They're two separate issues, I believe, because I think short-term rentals can affect anybody and everybody, any community. Um, and accessory dwelling units will only impact the people who want to put in you know, their accessory, actually build it. Um, but every time we bring up accessory dwelling units, naturally short-term rentals comes up as a concern. And so we wanted to say, if we regulated short-term rentals, then would you be in favor of accessory dwelling units? Or if we did this, then would you be in favor for this? So we wanted to give people the ability to respond with, instead of just yes or no, because there's so much context there, um, we, we thought, let's just combine them. We'll get all the feedback at this point. And then we can go forward to council and say, you know, we also got feedback on short-term rentals and here's the community saying on those as well. And maybe we won't do anything, but maybe we will move forward with an ordinance for that as well. Thanks. Um, in, in terms of the uh, short-term rentals, uh, some condominiums complexes have CCNRs. Yeah. And if there was an ordinance that mm -hmm. said something that was different than the CCRs, which one would get precedence legally? Oh, I'm glad you asked that. It would not impact the CCNRs. Okay. So if you already have CCNRs in place for ADUs or short term rentals, this would not override those. Okay. And I haven't seen it, the survey yet. Um, sometimes when you lead into a survey, I've, I've seen you, you've written things just to give people some guidance, mm -hmm. but you said it's totally open-ended. There's no kind of discussion of the pros and the cons and the typical arguments you heard in mm -hmm. South Lake Tahoe about some of the stuff, things like that. We define both okay. terms. We define what an accessory dwelling unit is and what a short-term rental, VRBO or Airbnb typically are. Um, but other than that, we did not say here's some arguments for or against. Um, because like I said, we and one of the comments we got was, well, why didn't you tell us what you're thinking? What 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 are you trying to draft or what are you trying to come up with? And we intentionally did that so we can try to get the best response rate of if we can do it right, this many people will support it. On the question, is this wrapped up into the broader issue of affordable housing that I know you're also mm -hmm. you've got a thing starting tomorrow? I'll do a quick plug. We have three meetings <laughs> for affordable housing. I want my commission um, later. Right? Thank you for bringing <laughs> that up. Um, we have one tomorrow at noon, one Thursday at 5 p.m., one Monday at 9 a.m. Um, and they're all virtual. So if you'd like the link, I can shoot over to Appy. Um, but this is separate from affordable housing. Okay. We want to make sure, because it's such a contentious issue, that we focus purely on accessory mortgage. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Question, just to clarify, the ADU is what's commonly called like a mother-in-law house? Correct. But it doesn't have to be detached, right? Correct. 
Okay. And the uh, the STRs are what commonly are called Airbnb. Correct. So somewhat related, but could be quite unrelated. Some concerns we get is if my neighbor builds a accessory dwelling unit, they're just going to try to make money and rent it out as an Airbnb. We'll have parties, it'll change the neighborhood, the parking will be an issue. Um, and it comes up all the time, even with just home, you know, single family homes that if they can be up in the common place. So we that's why we wrapped it in together. And to clarify mother-in-law's quarters, we currently allow for detached guest quarters, but they do not have a kitchen. So the only difference between the accessory dwelling unit and a guest quarters or mother-in-law's quarters is that. Defining how much kitchen has to be there to be a kitchen. Oh, I have the definition. <laughs> <laughs> it's a technically utilities or uh, you know a plug for a stove and uh, a stove and a refrigerator because it has to fit it. All those things, and so you can't have a sink, you can't have a main fridge, or sometimes they have burners in there. It's not super different, but it might allow people more flexibility. Okay. I guess what you said about the difference is that you can't have a short um, TV. One of them would not have a refrigerator. For an accessory so, dwelling unit, we currently allow guest quarters or granny flats. Mm -hmm. They just cannot have a kitchen. And the way we define that is typically a stove and a plug for a refrigerator, you know, like a normal heavy duty mm -hmm. refrigerator. So you can have a sink and you can have a bathroom and uh, a mini fridge, stuff like that. So very similar, uh, but it allows for more flexibility to put a full kitchen and detached construction. Great. Well, my information is out there. I think it's on the survey, but if not, um, reach out to Abby and she can forward it your way if you have any questions, but please get the word out there so you can try to get that response rate up. Um, and so it's a good yeah. representation. Great. Thank, Thank you, guys. Grace. Thank you. I'd like to ask one question. Yeah. Maybe, um, the people that Jeff was mentioning, we had quite a, quite a few public commenters, yeah. I think, and I, I did not keep their information, but could, could we have that from they would have written that down for you, right? So yes, if they um, provided their email or their phone number, I will be able to send them. Yeah, I would like to contact them because mm -hmm. I think they, they, they would really like to participate. I, yeah, I agree. It was a perfect timing. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but yes I can definitely reach out to them. Perfect. All right. Up next, uh, we have uh, Keep Trucking Metals Beautiful. Over here, Yeah, fine. Um, I, hopefully I can see the uh, the numbers. My eyesight is getting a little worse. Um, all right, well, uh, thanks everybody for having us. Uh, my name is Matt Weber. I'm with uh, KTNB. This is where Keep Trucking Matters Beautiful. Uh, we're a local nonprofit. We do environmental work in the community. This is, we're kind of doing our uh, end of the year impact statements, letting the cabs and nabs and parks departments and anybody who wants to uh, to know all the stuff, awesome things we did in 2023. So does everybody kind of know what KTMB is or what we do? Yeah, so we've been around, we're an environmental nonprofit, uh, 501c3, we've been around since 1989. Uh, a lot of people know us for our cleanups, our community cleanups, as well as our group cleanups. But we also have an educational program, both youth and adults. Uh, as well as our recycling guide as well too. So we work with different uh, different municipalities as well as agencies to get our uh, work done. Uh, the first slide there is uh, the main agencies we work with. Uh, this program, I'm gonna talk to you about our volunteer program, so cleanups. Uh, so I've been with KTMB for about five years. Uh, I was a volunteer for five years before. Um, I've been, I'm born and raised in Reno. I went, left for college, came back, um, and I saw the amount of growth that we had, uh, you know, and so I really wanted to get, get back to our community. And so this is my way of doing it. Uh, so this program uh, has been around since 1994, the Community Cleanups Program. Uh, it's volunteer driven. So uh, we, we want to make sure that people in our community have an opportunity to give back through uh, 
cleanups, uh, any kind of beautification projects, uh, planting trees and shrubs, uh, native brush as well. It just gives our uh, community a better place to live, work, and play. So this is kind of a variety of reasons why people would volunteer. Uh, that, you know, everyone volunteering is kind of a personal thing. Uh, people have different reasons for doing it. This is kind of a, a mishmash of everything that, or reasons that we've seen. Uh, they care about our community. Uh, they want to, you know, make a statement. Uh, it's a lot of the fraternities, sororities, and churches. That's their big thing. They bring out huge swaths of people and do amazing, amazing amount of work in a short amount of time. Uh, they want to make their community uh, safer, more beautiful for residents as well as wildlife. Uh, community pride is also another reason why we do this. So we all want to give back to our community in that way. Uh, community service credits is also a big one. We uh, work with TMCC, uh, the Promise Scholarship Program. Basically, they get free uh, community college tuition. Uh, if they have a certain GPA, they do a certain amount of uh, eight hours of community service every six months uh, and then do a kind of mentorship program. Um, you know, we work with uh, Boy Scout groups, uh, scouting groups, uh, high schools, leadership, uh, environmental groups as well to kind of fulfill that requirement as well. And then the last one I put up there was, uh, it's fun and rewarding. I tend to think it is. It's not for everyone. Uh, you know, I was kind of one of the, the weird kids in, in school that would pick up trash coming in from the you know, recess, you know, just making sure that everything was uh, left better than when we found it. So it's not, like I said, it's not for everyone, but if you, you know, if you enjoy it like I do, I find it uh, a fun and rewarding. And the really kind of cool thing about our program is it is all-inclusive. Uh, and this is kind of a, a sampling of a lot of the groups that we work with. And uh, you can kind of see it's very, it's very diversified. Um, one of the things, that's part of my job is working with families. You know, it's good to see uh, families get involved. Uh, I didn't get into volunteering until I was in my 30s. And so I kind of felt like I missed out on that. Um, so whenever we have families volunteering with you know, kids, I, I really, that's something that kind of warms my heart. Uh, and they, you know, they learn skills, they meet people, uh, they you know, give back to the community. So that's my favorite part of the job is seeing family volunteers. So that's kind of some of the people that we work with, the groups. People always ask where we clean. I know that uh, with the growth of our community, we've seen uh, a lot of a lot of nuisance, you know, violations, just like that. We only work on public uh, property, so that includes business corridors, roadways, parks, uh, sections of the river, open space areas, any area that is public. Uh, we can't, unfortunately, can't work on private property uh, due to trespassing laws. So uh, we work with our municipalities, uh, Reno, Sparks, and Washoe County, uh, whatever jurisdiction to, uh, and we, if we do get calls or complaints about uh, private property, uh, quality of life or nuisance violations, we direct them to the code, code enforcement. Uh, and they've been really good about uh, that rain on direct is, uh, is very responsive. And so we appreciate that. So, so we work with uh, different municipalities, whatever kind of their needs are to the specific area. And all of our, the places that we do clean, that's all contingent upon safety. Uh, safety is our priority. So there are some areas like, I know we work, uh, some of our, uh, in Sparks, we had some grandfathered uh, cleanups along Vista and Sparks Boulevard. Uh, Sparks has requested that we uh, don't do those anymore because it's, the safety risk with uh, speeding cars. There are some grandfather groups that still do that, but all this stuff is based on safety. That's my that's my biggest uh, concern. Groups doing. I'll be as accommodating as possible, but when it comes to safety, that's something we have to make sure that we're uh, abiding by. So, so uh, people ask, what will we do? And uh, while a lot of people are not, you know, trash picking up litter is a major problem. Uh, but we also do a lot of other uh, beautification, different, different projects. Uh, spreading mulch is one of our uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot recently because of the weed weed problem that we've had uh, last year's winter uh, was pretty crazy. So the weeds in the summertime were out of control in a lot of ways. So we've been pulling a lot of invasive weeds as well as noxious weeds as well, and also just weeds you know for areas that uh, in urban parts that that just looks better. Uh, so weeding, trimming vegetation, uh, you know, we, we trim a lot of uh, trails areas as well as willows. Willows have been growing up as well and kind of encroaching. Dog waste removal, that's kind of based on uh, certain areas as well. Graffiti, uh, we either paint over it or we have graffiti removal. 
Uh, we also like painting restrooms is another thing too that we've been working with the parks, Reno Parks Department, uh, getting those taken care of as well. Um, sweeping uh, courts as well, planting trees and shrubs and native brush is something that we we're also kind of getting in. I, I like those kind of events as well, uh, well because they it's planting a tree or something like that. You can see it grow and you can see the you know, see everything that you've done. It's kind of a more uh, long lasting uh, impact. Uh, and then the last two, vandalism and unsafe work conditions, or excuse me, yes, un unsafe uh, conditions. The kind of essence of the program is to be the eyes and ears of the area. So we rely on our volunteers as well as citizens and any other action groups. If they see something that needs to be taken care of, they can come to us as well as Rand Direct, and we can determine, we can either send a group out there if one's available, or we can refer it to whatever municipality. Uh, necessary. So, like certain things, like repairing playground equipment, need to be certified. So we give those, we give those back to the municipality. So. so this program is completely free. It's all paid for by a grant from uh, Northern Nevada Public Health, it's formerly known as Washington County Health District. Uh, everything is included. Uh, it's kind of a real turnkey uh, program. You know, all you need, we'll provide everything, uh, staff time. The, all the equipment, the litter pickers, everybody loves those. The rakes, we have a you know, huge two, actually three huge um, sheds and connex containers, the shipping containers full of rakes and shovels and you know anything that you need for landscaping or anything like that. So it's all free. I would rather see it out in the community than sitting in our our sheds over the weekend. So uh, if you have you, know, you have something you want to you know, take care of, you know, we'll provide the tools there. And then all you got to do is provide the enthusiastic volunteers. And I wrote enthusiastic on there, and we don't even really care if they're enthusiastic uh, because <laughs> we actually had a, a few years ago, we had a, a group, uh, the day summer day camp, and they were, uh, I guess they had mess, made a mistake, and the counselors wanted to punish them. And so they contacted us, <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, you're going you're gonna, to you know, do some hard, you know, do some labor. And then we ended up actually like creating a trail, like laying some DG and, you know, creating a trail up at uh, Rancho and uh, the kids and at the end of the you know the project the kids loved it they were like this is cool we're like construction workers and everything uh, so we got the last laugh when it came to that so <laughs> uh, so this is the impact for 2023 the numbers uh, and so these numbers right here are only for our group cleanups the next slide is actually our two community cleanups so you can kind of see uh, what we've uh, accomplished it's been pretty uh, it's pretty not quite uh, as high as 2021, where we had we were setting major records because of the pandemic, but um, kind of a little bit higher than our average year, uh, and that's probably due to population growth. Um, so you can kind of see what we did. One of the things that people always ask is uh, so you can see the volunteer or the cleanups, and then the volunteers, and then the volunteer hours is the number of volunteers uh, that we had times the amount of hours they worked. So like just for sake of easy. If uh, there was 10 people and they worked three hours, that would count for 30 volunteer hours. The next one, uh, the 300, you know, that's uh, that number is uh, calculated based off of the $26 and $18 rate that is calculated by a uh, think tank out of Washington, D.C. They do it for every state. Uh, it goes up. It's based on like different analytics, um, like poverty rate, and just, you know, the, the wages and everything. And so that number right there is the volunteer hours. Uh, multiplied by that number to get the 300,000 uh, numbers. So that's kind of a financial impact as far as taxpayer uh, information as well. Um, and then you can see the green waste and the the uh, trash numbers are always high or have been pretty uh, pretty good. Uh, the Sharps container or the Sharps uh, one is something that the health district or Northern Nevada Public Health has really wanted to focus on in the past few years. Um, finding needles and syringes in parks. Uh, it has gone up and uh, I've been here for five years and I've noticed people have been writing in their comments that they've seen an increase in that as well too. So the health district wanted us to start getting numbers on that uh, as well too. So, and then the, the uh, trees and, and grasses and different things like that we plant as well are there too. So. We have two uh, community-wide uh, large cleanups. So when I mean community community wide, I mean it's open to anyone in the community. That last slide was for groups, so like businesses, churches, fraternities, sororities, scouting groups like that. So this these are our two uh, large cleanups. And I won't give you the numbers, but 
We have a great community cleanup, but that's in uh, Earth Month. It's the last weekend in uh, September. It's kind of a spring cleanup. You can see the numbers. They're uh, pretty impactful. We, you know, we get anywhere from 700, 800 you know, groups or uh, people on one in one day. And so you can, you can imagine the impact uh, that's created. And then we have a fall uh, cleanup. It's a Chucky River cleanup, and that's more focused on the watershed. And when the water is lower, so we can make more of an impact there. So these are our two uh, large community cleanups. You've probably seen advertising uh, volunteers as well as the impact as well. So, and then part of the at, at, for these cleanups, we do have uh, volunteer appreciation um, picnics at the end. Uh, so that we want to make sure that our volunteers are, are acknowledged and, and recognized for all the awesome and amazing work that they do in our community. The next few slides are just kind of some pictures of cleanups that happened in the last few months. This is kind of our slow time. Uh, it'll start picking up probably mid-February, depending upon the weather, of course. Um, but yeah, so you can see ATO was a, clean, uh, a fraternity. They did the Paradise Park, which is one of on our hot list. And on uh, and Mac, uh, and that's, yeah, and we're working with the Councilman uh, Mart Martinez, as well as uh, Donna Klontz, you know, trying to get something set up for that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge park and it's, jurisdictionally you know, kind of has a weird thing. So whenever I have groups that want to do something and they're not sure, I usually send them to Paradise Park just because of the size of it. So. And then uh, Ray Reno Phil was at uh, Virginia Lake Park and they did, uh, they pulled some weeds along uh, Lakeside Drive as well as uh, picked up trash along the, the shoreline in the playground and the dog park there. And then the RSCDA, Visitors Authority, uh, they actually adopt the McKinley Arts and Culture Center. So that cleanup was uh, pretty much leaves. Uh, so most of the bags uh, were filled with leaves. Yeah, so our upcoming events, uh, Christmas tree recycling just ended uh, on Sunday, uh, but it'll be every year. That's where we uh, basically take all the trees people you know, have for their Christmas festivities. We gather them up, we chip them, and then we use that mulch uh, to for a weed abatement throughout the year. Um, the Great Community Cleanup is what I mentioned before. This year it'll be April 27th. And then uh, Bicentennial Flower Planting, which is right down here. I'm not sure if it's in Ward 5 or what more it is with the exchange. But yeah, we plant about 5,000 of the ornamental flowers in Bicentennial Park uh, with the Reno a Rotary Club. Uh, yeah, it's a great, that's a cool, cool program. We work with the scouting uh, Girl Scouts as well too. And then, uh, Next year's Chucky River cleanup is going to be uh, September 21st. So if I could leave you with something, uh, anything, it would be uh, if you're interested, if you have a business, you know, people in your business want to do a cleanup church or anyone that you're interested, families, um, you come see us. Uh, we'll put you on the cleanup calendar and we'll get you going. Or if you wanted to even do it as an individual, uh, we provide all our litter pickers. We have there were like 5,000 litter pickers. Uh, and if you wanted to stop by our office and pick one up and get the bags, gloves, anything you need for an event, it's all paid for and uh, it's free. And we appreciate uh, anyone that wants to come out and, and help us. And before I forget, I uh, brought some, I'll stick around through the end of the uh, meeting, um, but I brought some swag for you. There's some uh, canvas bags, uh, ice scrapers and hand warmers, uh, as well as some other stuff there too. So. Any questions? Um, most, first of all, thank you very much. I mean, I love seeing the photographs of yeah. people of all ages and backgrounds coming together. I'm most interested in, do you, when you get together with uh, children from schools, is there an educational component? Do you take time yeah, to yeah. educate yeah. as well? That's a good question. Good, good question. I'm glad you brought that up. So what we have is what we call service learning. And so we have, uh, we have, we have an AmeriCorps program and we have educators who work in that, and then we have an educate uh, both youth and adult educators. And so the service learning aspect is uh, so, like, say, you know, Jesse Beck's school, uh, they want to learn about the different mod. We have three different modules for education: weeds, water, and um, waste. And so, uh, like, in, for weeds, uh, if there was an area near the school or even in the, on the school campus where they wanted to pull weeds, we do uh, an hour-long weeds uh, presentation and with activities, and you know just kind of fun stuff. And then the next hour, it would be pulling the weeds. So they would learn about it and they would act on what they've learned. Uh, so like uh, for water, it would be, you learn about 
non-point source pollution and the river and how important it is. 85% of our water comes from, from that river, so our drinking water. So, you know, you learn about it and then you go out and help clean it up. Uh, same thing with waste. Uh, so you learn about recycling, sustainability, uh, all that, and then you go pick up trash. So yeah, it's, we call it service learning. Usually it's an hour of each. Kind of depends on how, how much they're liking the, the learning part of it. We do have like activities. It's actually, it's really fun. It's the, uh, they have, act it's not just like, lecturing to them they actually like learn through doing like activities and then the uh, our department takes over and they actually do the, the volunteer work so it's actually one of the best parts of the job we're trying to expand that side of the program thank you for asking thank you for thanks everybody uh, and uh, appreciate you having us thank you We're ready to move to B6. I'm sorry, uh, B5, review and discussion of the Ward 5 community project. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to sit right here and talk if that's okay. So for um, those of you that aren't familiar with this, this is pretty unique to this map. Um, they're doing something kind of piloting a project. Um, so Council Member Taylor decided to uh, engage her NAV in identifying an issue uh, that they wanted to sort of learn more about and try to help tackle within the work. Um, in June of 2023, they kind of generated this list of problems that they experienced either themselves or heard from other people in the ward um, that they, they felt could use uh, some, some support and uh, the contribution of $5,000. Um, and then among the issues that they identified, they chose substance abuse and specifically overdose, overdose fatalities as an issue that they wanted to learn a little bit more about and to work to address within the ward. Um, then in September, we also kind of talked through some of the, the analytical questions. Who's experiencing the problem? What is it? Who's already doing the work in the space? Um, it's a little bit difficult to carry out a project as a board who is subject to open meeting law um, and can't meet as a group you know, in private to try to come up with ideas and things like that. Everything they do is subject to this format and has to be you know, put onto an agenda and subject to um, public comment. So it was important, I think, to the board to really work to understand the issue. What does it look like here locally? Because of course, substance abuse is a, a huge problem across the country and I'd venture to say across the world. Um, but they wanted to learn more about what that looked like here and what were the initiatives and programs already in place to try to remedy some of the issues that we were experiencing. Uh, so in October, we had a presentation from Anne Elizabeth with Join Together Northern Nevada, and we have a couple of representatives here from JTNN today as well. One of them is Anne Elizabeth. And then, can you tell me your name again? Tanika. Tanika yes. as well. Okay. And so um, in October, we heard a little bit uh, more about the existing initiatives um, that JTNN has in place, and they're an organization we learned that works with just about every stakeholder in the area. Um, and we got a really good look at some local data. What what do overdose um, what what do overdoses look like in the area? Fatalities. Uh, we had like a heat map of where they kind of take place and under what conditions as well. So we learned a lot more about um, what that looks like here. Um, and then Gary made a. I'm just giving you a recap so we know how we got here because it's been a couple months since we've met. Um, and so then I believe Gary made a proposal to support um, JTNN's Uber Health program, which helps people who are in recovery get to the appointments that are so critical to keep them on track with their recovery. And I'm not going to speak anymore about that because I am not the subject matter expert, but we do have 
um, the subject matter expert here. So I would like to just say for today, um, your task is to consider whether that is the recommendation you would like to make to council member Taylor for those funds. And our representatives from JTNN are here to answer any questions that you may have. Or let, also feel free to add if I missed anything. Did we really do all that? We did. It it's a lot. You did. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to, to say that I really appreciated your help in bringing forth information and prompting us to do the right things. We tend to want to move faster than we should, but um, I, I would, I, I can only speak, for, I, I'll speak from my perspective, you know, living downtown, um, when Anne Elizabeth showed uh, the number of overdoses, um, it rocked me to my core. Uh, I just couldn't believe what's all around us happening. Um, also, just personally, I have a family member that um, was addicted to opioids. He was well the other side of it, thank goodness. But I do know that the sessions that she attended for quite a long period of time uh, to talk through her issues and get support, direction, and help to the next stage in recovery was absolutely critical. If it wasn't for that, I fear what may have happened uh, to my family. So when I heard that oftentimes the smallest things can cause somebody to uh, basically lose their path, the way they're going, uh, in particular, if they're already in a, a recovery program and they're doing okay, but for economic reasons or they're too far away and they can't get there, that to me was an immediate kind of need and an urgent thing that needed to be done. That and the fact that, as Anne Elizabeth pointed out, uh, the program and the money, the funding for it had just run out. And it, it seems like if you think about it, you couldn't get there, you couldn't get it. But well, you know what? It doesn't matter. If someone started down the road to recovery, the most stupid thing socially and personally is to because they can't get somewhere that they just fall backwards again. That's bad for the person, it's bad for their family, it's bad for society. Mm -hmm. So it seemed to me when I saw the articles about the Uber program uh, and their HIPAA, the drivers are HIPAA qualified, so their confidentiality is there. And that I heard some stories, maybe uh, Anne Elizabeth, you might want to relate a couple. I asked, can you tell me some stories besides the numbers? You know, where did this make a difference to have somebody carry it through? Um, I, I just thought this was, to me, the kind of thing we were looking for. Um, as something that needed help, something that was worthwhile, good for people, good, good for Ward 5, and good for the society we live in. So personally, I'm very supportive, but I've been talking the most, listing the most, so I would like it to turn it over to my colleagues here for their comments and questions. I'll say my piece. Um, I spent 28 years in law enforcement, <clears throat> and I was exposed to a lot of drug addiction and um, nowhere near in my 28 years that I see the explosion of fentanyl that is creating these, these addictions and overdoses to the extent that it's overwhelming societies. So my perspective, although it's a limited amount of money that we could provide, it's something that we can help and it's a, a fantastic cause, and, and it's one that's not going away. We, we need to get as much help to these people as we can, and so I'm I'm strongly uh, for this. That's my perspective. My son is a, a police officer in the Bay Area, and uh, he tells me how much they're running into the overdoses on a regular basis. It's just frightening. It's absolutely frightening. So if we can help in that regard, getting people on the path of recovery, keeping them on the path of recovery, I'm all for it. So you have my support. Well, we lived in environments that are more like this type of a problem. I'm aware of the things that it is. 
but I've seen it for years, and I don't see that there's always, always, always a problem. And you know, I think it's quite nice to think that you actually do something. There's plenty of programs out there that have been R and D and have been for years. So what you know, what would the purpose be when you attach something to a particular program? Say so that this is what Sidney Juno's um his voice feels is the right thing to do or or help. I mean, what what would we get out of this? But, there's an existing program that yeah. is run by an Elizabeth's organization. So it was it's always already got a number of statistics to prove the worth of the program, the number of rides given, the number of people kept in the programs. So what we would be doing in a very narrow way is to support that by providing some funds to start that up again to get people that, that transportation. The other the other thing I'm interested in, Carol, too, is um, can we challenge other groups, other organizations to match that's or that's to get good. involved? Could we yeah. be one that would lead the other NABs yeah. down a certain path and spend time to talk, go and talk to them? I like that. That um, sounds good. So mm -hmm. I, I, that's a broader kind of thing. Yeah. It's a different question. It might be a different project. Well, to me, this was quite broad, but we narrow it down to something a little more specific. Could actually help. Elizabeth, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. And lovely to meet you all in person. I'm happy to be here. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so it sounds broad when you look at it on paper, and I, and I can understand uh, your perspective there. Um, the Uber Health program is really scalable. So when we were doing it via the CDC grant, we were able to do a pretty broad reach across Washoe County for anyone who needed substance misuse treatment. Um, in collaboration with you, we can set some boundaries around that so that that money goes um, specifically to um, to specific things. So we can scale that down so that that $5,000 really makes the impact that you're looking to make. Mm -hmm. um, and so that can look like um, we service specific treatment centers. Um, and I have some data about what the most common treatment centers are that people were calling for rights for. Um, or we narrow that down, if we're taking more of a harm reduction approach, we'd narrow that down to MAP programs, the Medicated Assisted Treatment. Um, or if we want to go the maintenance and recovery route, we can narrow that down to AA or NA meetings. We can really tailor it so that it's making the impact that you're looking for. Um, and it's, it is an easy program to scale up or down based on those sorts of boundaries. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, as far as the program goes, it can be as broad or as narrow as we all kind of collaborate on that process. And I'm happy to collaborate with this um, board. Good, thank you. The other thing that impressed me too, Anna Elizabeth, is there's still some rigor to it, right? I mean, people just can't keep missing rides and wasting money. You just have to pay somebody if the driver turns up. It's literally three strikes and you're out. So there's a certain level of responsibility on the individuals as well. Question I have for you is from your experience, um, is it harder to get someone into treatment or for them to stay in treatment? Staying in treatment. Okay. Staying in treatment. That's what I thought. Um, people often hit that rock bottom place where they're where they're ready to go into treatment. Um, they may start treatment and then there's something that gets in the way. Those social determinants of health like transportation, which has been identified as a gap, really get in the way of, of staying in treatment. And um to speak to your point about stories, um, there have been many, many stories in this Uber Health program of folks who um said, you know, if I didn't make this one appointment, I would have not have stayed sober today. Um, and that's, AA talks a lot about one day at a time. And that's so true for those um, folks that are in recovery and moving through the process, whether it's through a 12-step program or through a treatment um, or through a combination of things, um, that one day at a time. And, and these riots provide that lifeline um, to that uh, process. Um, and so, uh, and I know when we stopped the program in September, we had to have very difficult phone conversations with people who had been using the service for approximately six months. Um, and their question was, what will we do without you? Right? We can't make it without this. Um, and so those conversations 
Um, I was thinking about that today as I was preparing for this meeting and um, that question has become, what will they do without us? Right. So um, thank you. Could you also just uh, tell us something about your, your board of directors? Uh, from what, what I remember, it's pretty broad across a number of different disciplines uh, where uh, drug issues. Yeah, I'll talk in about that a bit. Um, as a community coalition, um, we are uh, tasked with serving the 12 sectors of the community. And so our board is representative of those 12 sectors. Um, we have people from government. Um, we have law enforcement on our board. Um, we have uh, parents on our board. We have um, juvenile justice folks on our board, um, community, community members at large on our board. So we try to reach all 12 sectors in all of the work that we do because we know that those voices um, all together can make the strongest impact. Um, any other questions or? So with the next thing be to make a formal motion? A recommendation. A recommendation, okay, a recommendation. So Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll just make a recommendation that this uh, NAB recommends to Council Member Taylor that the $5,000 discretionary fund award that uh, we were given the opportunity to look into be awarded to JTNN for the specific purpose of paying for Uber rides to substance disorder treatment appointments. As part of that, that we arranged some future date to get feedback, and I would like to visit and uh, participate. Make a motion to approve that recommendation. I'll make a motion to, to approve that recommendation. And second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That'll be referred to yeah. Ms. Yeah. Taylor. Yeah, she's actually on the Zoom, I think. So, okay. she, she's, yeah, okay. she's, she's, <laughs> so she heard all the things. If, if okay. I, may, I ask the question as to who we go from here. So, this would, this if she approves it, she would make this a recommendation from the consent agenda of a future city council meeting. Correct. If, if she's open to it, I would. I know she has to call out that item Correct. to have. I, I would really like to invite Anne Marie and any other of your staff you'd like to have there so that we could speak, the lab could speak to it a little bit, publicize it a bit, yeah. and maybe lay down some challenges to the other city council members or whoever might be in attendance. Yeah. Is that something we could consider? Yes, yes. we'll that, definitely coordinate. Um, and that boards too. We yeah, should go to that boards. Sure. Yeah. You're also always welcome to give public comment. So if you know, I'm sure she'll want to pull it. But if she yes. did not, you could come and get public comment about it. So we'll coordinate, uh, yeah. and we'll hopefully do that soon on one of the agenda. That's great. Thank, Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we'll be moving on to B6, uh, so B6, or B.6-1, Reno X. Do we have any representative from Reno X today? Hi. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. My name is Alex. The gentleman next to me's name is Phil. Okay. Today, we're going to be talking about what we're currently doing at Reno X. For those of you who don't know what we are, what we do, what we plan to do with this new permit, uh, kind of a surrounding area impact, and then we'll wrap it all up for you. All right, cool. So who are we? So like the name would suggest, Reno Axe, we throw axes. It sounds dangerous. I promise you it's not. Um, we, outside of just throwing axes, offer two bars, one on the main level, which is street level, and then one in the downstairs basement area. The basement area houses a lot of fun games like pool, air hockey, darts. Uh, and both of those bars operate until 1 a.m. on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, 11 p.m. all other days of the week. On an average year, we're serving just above 75,000 customers, and we currently employ 25 employees every year. On an average weekend night, we have six security staff, and I want to touch on that just briefly. Each member of the security team is handpicked, usually from other bars in the area. They all have extensive training in high-volume uh, bars and interactions, so we really want to make sure that we zone in on safety as our key component of everything that we do. 
Uh, we pride ourselves on being one of the best bars in Reno, uh, and that is thanks to the quality of our management team as well as the staff. Um, you know, we like to say that we're not a typical bar, and that's typically evidenced by the fact that we have a 100% pass rate of all police stings, uh, all random checks by the city. Every bar staff and security member has a valid AAT card, which is just an alcohol awareness card. Um, and we have intimate knowledge of our capacity at any given time. Uh, we're kind of have a representation, or not a representation, we have a reputation of being a pre-party bar. Now, what does that mean? Uh, typically, folks come to our bar first, and then they venture out into the night to go to other late night spots. And that's evidenced by us seeing a natural decline in our customer base right around the 10, 11 o'clock time. Our intention with this permit request is to remain busy for an extra couple hours. We're not trying to be a nightclub. We really don't want to be a nightclub. Uh, we just want to have a fun, inviting space for an extra couple hours where we can do things like a DJ or karaoke, uh, and we really only plan on going for an extra two or three hours. Okay? These pictures here, while small, um, do kind of showcase the area that this change is going to largely impact. This is that basement area. The top slide is from the back facing forward, and the bottom one is kind of where a lot of the DJ stuff would go because we can move a lot of that stuff. There can be a little bit of an area where people can dance if they want to. All right, so let's talk about the surrounding area and what that means. So again, we pride ourselves in wanting to protect and improve the downtown area. We have many staff members and family members that live, work, play in the downtown area. So it's incredibly important to us that we provide a clean and safe environment. Um, we are trying to add more entertainment to the downtown city. I guess it's kind of a comment from there. Uh, and have been successfully doing so for almost a decade. We have multiple businesses in the downtown area, not just Reno X. Uh, in Within walking distance from us are a litany of bars. I won't list them all, but there's a good example of them all up there for you. Uh, some of the concerns that we're faced with uh, by going later into the night is foot traffic. Well, we are of the belief that by running later, we can actually have a positive impact on foot traffic because the folks that want to stay with us for longer are going to. So they're not gonna be venturing out into the night looking for all these late night bars. They're gonna be hanging out with us. Um, Fights, unruly customers, things are kind of um, pigeonholed to bars. Um, Reno Axe has a fantastic representation with fights. In the four years that we've been doing this, we have had a total of three fights. Only one of them have we had to call the police, but our security staff is really on top of it. We're really paying attention. We are really good at de-escalating something before it happens. Um, we have a lot of customer testimonial coming up to us throughout the night saying, we really appreciate the job that you're doing, that you're paying attention, and that you feel safe, free from these kind of annoying bar interactions that you can sometimes have at other places. On top of that, we are very used to calling the police if we need to. We're used to calling the downtown ambassadors, and we just keep an eye on everything that's around us. Um, along with the bar operating longer, there is a concern for more drunk patrons or drunk drivers. Um, I myself have personally called for an Uber and paid for it out of my own pocket for some folks that have come in. And I know that story is not really me, but along with my staff, um, I can point to several interactions where bartenders and security teams have called Ubers, have called cabs for people because they were too intoxicated. On top of that, the alcohol awareness training that all bar staff must go through talks about over-serving or over-intoxication. We do a really good job of monitoring that. And when we think somebody is getting to that point, we cut them off. And it's, it's a polite conversation. We're never trying to embarrass somebody. Uh, and then noise. So again, going later into the night, often there is a concern about more noise. Uh, we ran most, multiple uh, decibel level tests. Um, the live entertainment would be going downstairs. And because it is in the basement area, there is no impact on the surrounding area or on the street level. Uh, we talked about noise. In fact, I think a lot of this, we can, you want to talk to this? No, I think we can skip this. <laughs> and then in conclusion, um, really just kind of talking again about the rigors that we go through with training and staffing. We really pride ourselves of being one of the best bars in downtown Reno. Uh, again, evidenced by our perfect record with stings and city compliance. Um, we are looking to operate for an additional two to three hours uh, with no changes to the current business during the week. 
Uh, we believe it'll be a benefit to the surrounding areas. Uh, like we talked about in the previous slide, we think that our extension of hours will mean less people looking to go to other places after 1 a.m. Um, but again, we have a very well-trained security <laughs> team. Um, and most of these changes are going to be in our basement anyway. So we really are um, striving to be a good partner to downtown Reno. And we want to continue to bring really awesome, fun activities to the area. Okay. Any questions? Alex, I have a few questions just from the point of view of a resident who lives close to nightclubs. In fact, I can see uh, your your bar from the montage. So, uh, in terms of the, the sound, did you do this, or did you have an independent uh, sound acoustical engineer do the sound tests? We didn't do it. So it wasn't done by a licensed acoustical engineer. No. Okay. I, the only reason I mentioned that on the application forms, that says that's a requirement and the planning commission may want you to do that. Um, second question I had is uh, the closest resident to you, uh, the people in the Palladio. Mm -hmm. And I know that they've had some problems and a complaint to code enforcement about the bar opposite sticks. Um, have you had any complaints from the neighborhood there? From the um, neighbors of the Palladio? I haven't heard anything directly from the Palladio. I am intimately familiar with some of the problems that the stick dealt with. Unfortunately, the stick is no longer in business. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw as a deterrent to a lot of those problems were proper categorization of fake IDs and being able to catch them immediately. In our experience, we've seen a lot of the problems are coming from people that are underage using fake IDs for whatever reason. And so, I mean, in our state, in our safe right now, we have probably 200 fake IDs that we take off the streets. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I don't want to speak ill of the stick. I don't think that they were properly checking their IDs. And so that's one of the things that we are making sure that we do to prevent some of these issues. But again, the Palladio residents or the board there or the <laughs> sound committee, believe it or not, you've never had any personal complaints or uh, been reported to Reno Direct or anything like that. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. We haven't gotten any either, Gary. Usually they come through and we'll see them or whatever, but I haven't got anything. That's good. That's good. Um, so are you, are you going to get a, a licensed engineer to do the sound study? And what kind of music will the DJ be playing? We're not quite sure. Okay. Would it be anything with a heavy, booming bass sound? Even if it was, it's in the basement. So there would be no noise impact to the street level. You may be surprised. Um, we have three um, cabaret licensed nightclubs uh, on 2nd Street between West and Arlington. And they close their windows, they close their doors, um, they put soundproofing in there. Uh, but certain types of music are on a scale that don't register on what's called the A scale, decibel A scale. The C scale is the boom, 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 boom of rap music, of heavy bass. It could be jazz, it could be Led Zeppelin. I mean, I'm not picking on a particular music genre, but that you, know, you don't hear the lyrics, you don't hear the sound, you don't hear the gentle, and you hear bass boom. So I would just, that, why I'm pushing on that is that we're having, having problems with that and we're looking for changes to be made. So what you measured may not be what residents hear. Um, I think it would be a good idea also to just reach out as if you want to be a good neighbor to your neighbors at the Palladio yeah. and just have a chat with them, tell them the same thing here. You don't want them showing up for planning commission <laughs> with complaints. That would, I think would really help. But sound is a funny thing. It's There's so many variables that can affect it too. Believe it, wind, uh, humidity, uh, a whole bunch of stuff like that. So just be careful about that one because that's one of the major conditions that the planning commission mm -hmm. looked at is noise and effect upon the residences around that, even in this zoned area. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit more about, so with the extra two, it's the extra two hours, it's 2 a.m. on Friday and Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. So are you still keeping the same six people and just extending their hours, two hours? Or are you getting additional people to spell them? Because that's a longer shift. Absolutely it is. Um, so the current plan that I have right now is to bring on what I like to call the mid-shift people. So I will hire additional staff to come in mid-shift so the late shift team isn't incurring overtime or these long, arduous hours. They're able to come in later and support those later hours. Okay, that's great. That's good to hear that. Um, 
when you mentioned here about uh, supervising crowd activity, mm -hmm. uh, what does that look like? Uh, do you mean like they will be like, do they line up outside now? On your only current when we, only when we reach capacity. Okay. That's okay. you know, speaking completely honestly, the only time that we get like that is usually during a bar crawl. And most bars we run at the same issue. So uh, we bring on extra staff for those events. And um, we have been doing the same thing for the last four years where when we do have folks lined up outside, we do have a dedicated security member that walks up and down the line, just making sure people are staying in line. Um, so that would be aligned, would it be? Would... Make sure you guys can. All right, all right, we're good. Back to back. All right, go ahead. If you want to repeat your question, Gary, sorry about that. You need to repeat it. Go ahead. Okay, so the question was regarding camera footage and uh, continuous monitoring. So internally, we do have cameras on both floors. They monitor and record for seven days at a time. And then the building that we reside in has cameras on the exterior that also record. Um, well, the question is about the basement. You, you think you'll be bringing more people up the streets. Does that change the capacity or your egress in the event of you know an emergency <clears throat> out of the base? Uh, any people in there? But if there's going to be more people than you've had before, is there any need for refire inspection or anything like that? Um, touching on just if we think we're going to bring in more people than normal, I don't think that we will. Um, again, the busiest times that we run into are during bar crawls, and that's really the only time that we actually hit our capacity. Um, so a need for a new egress is probably not required, but I'll let Phil speak more to capacity. Absolutely. We, we do have annual actually inspection in the fire department. We actually do for one right now. Um, so they are the one giving us 248 people capacity. Um, we're not planning on any changes on that. We do have two exits and we're happy with that amount. Um, and I just like Alex said, we are not planning on getting actually more people. We just want the people that are currently there to stay a little bit longer. Okay. Um, is there anybody from city staff? I have one quick question. For them. Yes. Okay. 
And then can you state your name? Yes. I'm Daniel Mortoma, Associate Planner Specialist for the Nice to meet you. Just two quick questions. Um, can this conditional use permit be conditioned specifically to those hours that uh, the owners want it for to 2 a.m.? Yes, it can. It, it can. Okay. Does it also, what other kind of conditions would be, would, would they, would any of the ones that change that they have that exist for the bar that they've had for four years? Um, could, could you specify? Maybe? Um, I don't know about if, you know, because it's longer hours. Does anything change in terms of keeping doors closed, windows closed? Because oh, um, I know I'm just from my experience with other bars that have gone later, there have been additional things. So I just want to make sure you're aware that might happen. As far as I understand, uh, no, but uh, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. But, uh, uh, because the, the actual use isn't changing. But uh, so, yes, the, uh, the hours can be conditioned specifically for 2 a.m. I see in the original application, it was, I think, 10 a.m. You know, but uh, um, but uh, yes, that can be conditioned to to that uh, specifically. But as far as any additional uh, conditions required, staff is is currently reviewing the project right now, uh, so there may be additional uh, conditions uh, uh, that required as part of uh, an approval for the city team. Um, uh, but. Uh, we're still in that review stage of, of the project. Okay. Um, not that these gentlemen said that they want to go to six in the morning. You didn't want sure. to be a nightclub, right? No. You need your baby. You, you need your baby sleep. Like I everybody. I did want to clarify. Um, we talked about make sure two or three hours. So granted, we're usually currently closing around midnight to one a.m. We're talking about potentially closing around three a.m. or four a.m. Which. It's not to say the plan, but so that's, well, that's not in the application that will go. Is it two a.m.? So it's two a.m. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that that would be that would need to change. We'll probably amend it to three a.m. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, if you change, if the gentleman or anybody in that position changes their mind and says, this is going so well, I want to push it to six, would they have to come back for a, an additional permit, a conditional use permit? They would, or would this be would uh, cover? Well, it, it depends on uh, the condition, if that's uh, specified for, let's say it was, uh, and this is just an example, but let's say it was specified for 2 a.m. in the condition, and they wanted to extend that to 3 a.m., 4 a.m., or 6 a.m., then, then they would need to come back for, for that. Okay. So this will be pretty tight to whatever, it when it's be, going to be 3 a.m., you're saying? Yeah. Okay. okay. If, if you, by the way, if you do want to contact the Palladio, I know quite a few people there that are interested, and I'd be happy to share that with you yeah. and give them a heads up that you might be contacting them. I think Absolutely. they would appreciate yeah. that. Absolutely. Jump in on your own. Jump in on your noise comment from earlier. Um, we're not fully sure indeed which music we're going to be playing with the DJ, but we're not going to change who we are and our DNA, I guess, of the company. So we're going to play the same music, most likely. Um, I don't want to have anything written, but I don't see any surprises there. There should not be no need to change the type of music we're playing. So we're already playing that music currently until 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. sometimes on Friday and Saturday. We have never heard any complaints so far. It is in the basement. So I totally hear you, your comment about the other bars or the nightclubs and how that can be noisy. We're in the basement. It, we cannot hear it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. We did some tests. We did some tests. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Moving on to item B7. Appointment of the chairperson. I'll do the next time. Okay. I nominate Gary. Okay. Can I get a second? I'm sitting. <laughs> <laughs> That's only if we can get back and I can sit in the mayor's chair. And sit. No. <laughs> <laughs> I like it in here. They said that, well, besides the 
Wi-Fi dropping. The sound is really good for the Zoom members, so that was nice. Yeah, it's good. Um, perfect. So we'll have Gary next month. Okay. Um, and then moving on to C items. Any reports and announcements? So moving on to D, do we have any future agenda items? The only one I was interested, I was going to ask whomever came from RPD, but uh -huh. um, Chief Dan says it's DEEDS program, Directed Engagement Enforcement Deployment Strategies. Mm -hmm. And she had a, a meeting, but she didn't go into very much detail. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if we could have some update from some of the RPD. Apparently there was a pilot study done there in town. And I think it'd be a lot of interest in the results of that. Yeah, no, that'd be great. We're de I'm definitely going to ask the new RPD member to come in February to give you guys the update. So hopefully he'll be able to answer questions, but I'll prep him about these. Any other future agenda items? Awesome. And then uh, public comment. We do have one individual in the room for public comment. <laughs> Mr. Mac Rossi. For the record, Mac Rossi, uh, I'm familiar with a few people here. Uh, I was more familiar before you kicked me off the board for a year. So I wanted to let you know that I've applied to reapply. So if there isn't space available, if I can't get your support, if there isn't space available, I'd suggest Gary, Gary quit and get over to the Planning Commission where he's really needed. <laughs> but thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Matt. Um, and then anyone on Zoom, if you would like to give public comment at this time, please raise your hand. You should be at the icon at the bottom. Perfect. Seeing none at this time, Mr. Chair. I have a motion for adjournment. Yes, I'll make a motion to adjourn. favor? Thank you. Thank you Excellent. Thank you. We have the 6.48 p.m. Thank you. 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 Thank you